What's up, Journey Church? Happy Palm Sunday, everybody. You guys excited to be in the house of God? You ready to go? Hey, can we quickly welcome all of those over at our Boynton campus and at church at home? We love you. Here at Lake Worth, we want to give a shout out to you guys. Everyone welcome them into the room, would you? Come on. Like Pastor Connor said, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here at Journey, and I just, I love uh, what I do. I love this place. Do you love your church? Come on. I'm going on nine years here on staff, which feels like an eternity, to be honest with you, in a good way, in a good way. I said that where it might have sounded like it wasn't. It's been an eternity. My goodness. No, no. I love this place so much. I love to see lives transformed. I hope you do as well. And it is my privilege to be preaching on Palm Sunday. This has kind of been now like a, a, a little bit of a, a tradition. I've preached the last few Palm Sundays. I love the opportunity to do so. And it's challenged me to grab even more out of the story. And I have a message for you today, but I, before I even get into it, I want to tell you this personally and over at Church at Home in Boynton, this was so personally convicting to me, okay? I, I want to tell you that right off the bat because I'm going to be preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to you today. Is that okay? Like we're, we're kind of in this thing together. Because the, the, what I stumbled upon in, in the material, and again, I love the Bible so much that you know that that Bible you carry, the Bible on your phone, even that digital thing or that physical, pa I like physical paper, by the way. Anyone love some physical paper? You just love the, the sound of, some people love their Kindles, which is like, I don't know, it's a little nerdy for me, but whatever. Like, I love you, Kindle people. I, I do like that you have the sensation of flipping the page and all that. However you read the Bible, do you know it's a living, breathing book? And it can speak to you in so many different ways. And I've opened the same passage before and gotten something so different from it. And I'm so excited today that God gave me a kind of a new, fresh word and a look at Palm Sunday. But I want to set up Palm Sunday. Pastor Matt even gave a little bit in worship of just a, a quick little setup. But I want to tell you, Palm Sunday is the start of Holy Week. And it's really Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But if you've heard me speak before or looked into the passage or theologians or historians, what they might say or commentate about it, many would call it the a-triumphal entry of Jesus or the not-so-triumphant entry of Jesus because in the natural, it looked kind of ridiculous. And I'm not saying that flippantly or, or, or to, to make fun at all. I think Jesus did this intentionally because how many of you know he came to overthrow a spiritual kingdom, not a physical one? The Jews were hoping he might overthrow this Roman government, this, this tyranny, this rule that had just been oppressing them for so long. But Jesus came to overthrow a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. And so this whole display is kind of silly. I want to paint the picture for you before we get into our text today. Jesus, before he even gets into the city, his disciples find a baby donkey. This is crazy. Read your Bible. It's a wild ride. It says this. They grabbed a colt of a donkey and that cult had never been ridden before. I think that's a funny little kind of snippet that we need to understand that Jesus, a grown man, rugged carpenter, probably rough hands, maybe wore Carhartt, I don't know. Like, just, just tough dude, right? Sitting on a baby donkey. Theologians and historians believe that he was probably so tall his feet were dragging on either side of this baby donkey. Like, you've got to get this picture in view. And it says he actually stops at the precipice of the city before he makes his way down the Mount of Olives and weeps over the city. Talk this, uh, I talked about this a few years ago, but our, our weeping Messiah, the weeping Savior, he literally comes to the edge of the city, and the first thing he does, church, is ugly cry. Like, you have to get that picture in your mind, that Jesus sees the, the spiritual condition of the city. Again, he's come to overthrow a spiritual kingdom, a spiritual rule that has been oppressing people for, for ages and ages. He is going to be the final sacrifice, and he comes to the precipice of the city and weeps over the city. And then he makes his way down in Jerusalem. In my theory, and I think theologians and historians would agree, there's not a very large crowd gathered it says his disciples, which we know his followers at that time. In this, in this season of his ministry, he actually began to lose some followers. 
People started to like cancel Jesus. They were like, no, you're starting to say some things that confront me in such a deep and personal way that I'm off the bandwagon, bro. I'm not following. I don't care how many loaves and fish you can turn into, you know, feed 5,000. I don't care. You walk down water. I, I'm, I'm out. Because you, you're, you're kind of getting into my face and stepping on my toes a little bit and telling me things that I just don't want to hear. Right? We all want a Jesus who agrees with us. We don't want a Jesus who confronts us and gets in our face and tells us things about ourselves that we don't want to hear. And so we know at this time the crowd has kind of shrunk down. But here's what I love about it. Here's what I love about the story still. Even though it's a little bit of a smaller group, they cause a stir in the city and especially among these religious leaders of the time. And here's where we pick up in the story and where I'm gonna grab my title and everything today from. And it's these short few verses in Luke 19, verse 36, or 36 through 40. And this will be up on the screen for you. We can all read along over at Boynton Church at home. You tuning in. Here it is, verse 36, it says this, and as he went along, people spread their cloaks onto the road. This is where we get Palm Sunday from, by the way. They're waving palm branches, which was a sign of, of military victory. They thought he was gonna be this amazing military leader. And they're spreading their cloaks on the road. This was copying the Caesars of that time, the rulers and kings of that time. They would lay down their cloaks so, so they wouldn't even have to touch the road. They're showing this reverence. Verse 37, when he came near to the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples, I like that Luke's trying to like blow it up a little bit. He's like, the whole crowd. It's only a few disciples. But here's what I love. They began to joyfully praise God in loud voices. Everyone say loud. For all the miracles they had seen. And listen to what they say. Verse 38, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. This is actually a nod to Psalm 118. Uh, they would know this scripture that a king was going to come. This savior king was coming. And look what they say. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees, here's where it gets good. In the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. In verse 40, and here's where we're going to camp out and kind of center our talk around today. He says, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Here's the title of my message today, church. Keep the rocks quiet. Keep the rocks quiet. And, and where I'm going to go today, I, I really, like I told you before, this is so deeply convicting to me. Because here's what Jesus asked me while I was preparing this. Like I'm in the middle of studying this and writing this out and I can't wait to preach on Palm Sunday. I've done it before. I'm all fired up. And Jesus asked me this question and I'll ask us totally as a group together. He said, Josh, if you, and I'll lump Journey Church in there. Come on, boy, in the church at home. If we were in that crowd, would we have been so vocal and so bold and such worshipers and so convinced, so convicted that the rocks would have kept quiet. He said, Josh, would you be one of the people that would be so bold about your faith in the presence of opposition immediately? Isn't that crazy? Jesus comes on the scene and people are instantly trying to cancel him. He said, Josh, would you be one of those? Journey, put yourself in that crowd. Maybe you individually in that crowd. Bill, Sue, Jane, Mary, whoever you are, and hear God ask you that question, would you have been one of the ones that would have been so vocal, caused such a stir that people were like, whoa, 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 let's not let this get out of hand. Jesus rebuked those disciples and he says, hey, if fill in the blank name were to be quiet, the rocks would cry out. Here's three things I want us to see from the passage. Are you with me today? You're feeling it already a little bit? <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I just, I felt so convicted. And maybe this will convict you even more or humble you a little bit. Here's my first thing that I'm pulling from this passage. I saw three things that kind of jumped right out at me. Here's the first, and maybe this will humble you and also encourage you at the same time. That God does not need you, but he wants you. That is a wild thought. Like, that came screaming off the page at me. That Jesus goes, hey, if these guys shut up, I'll use the rocks. 
They'll start to cry out in my place. In fact, Psalm, or Isaiah 55 says that the mountains and the hills proclaim his glory and, his, and they sing his praises and the trees clap their hands. God goes, I don't need you, but how much better is it to be wanted by God? Someone in this room or over at Boyne or at church at home needs to receive that today. That God loves you and he likes you. He wants you. And isn't that true love? Isn't that a true loving relationship? That my wife doesn't necessarily need me, but she wants me. Hello, all right? <laughs> I'm just saying. Although she does need me to put gas in her van, uh, apparently, because it's always on E. Any husband with me? She would be stranded everywhere. So maybe she does need me a little bit. But she wants me. She desires me. We got four kids to prove it, all right? Products of our passion, all right? I'm like, she, and I love her and I want her and I desire her. And that's a loving relationship, is it not? How good is it to be like, God, you don't necessarily need me, but you want me? He wants you to be part of this story. He wants you to be so vocal that the rocks would keep quiet. He loves you. He's, he's fearfully and wonderfully made you so intricately. And he doesn't make mistakes. He wants you. And you're like, me? Yeah, you. But he doesn't necessarily need us. And that humbled me when I realized that, like, God, you'll use anything to get your glory, but you've chosen to use me as a mouthpiece for you. Thank you, God. Anyone want to praise him for that? That he wants you, that he loves you, that he's called you to himself? And he's called you to be his ambassador and to represent and reflect him to the world around you. That is good. Here's the second thing that jumped off the page at me. Are you ready for this one? There will be voices and forces that will try to silence you as a believer. You just got to realize that. I mean, right off the bat, it's Palm Sunday. It's the victorious, triumphal entry of Jesus. And already there are voices of opposition. And can I just like clue you in, church? There are voices and forces trying to silence you. I don't know if you know that. The enemy in this world and its agenda, they want to silence you, intimidate you, threaten you, shut you up, cancel you, and make you feel crazy for believing all of this. But the response cannot be our silence. I am so convicted to tell you this, church. Silence is the exact opposite of the Great Commission. The response cannot be our silence. Because it's the exact opposite of what we've been called to do. We've been called to go into all the world and proclaim the good news that Jesus came. He says, I came to bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty the captive, to bring light into darkness, to heal the sick, to raise the dead. Do you not think people want that? We got to give them some good news. We got to proclaim it and live it. And in any way we can be so bold with that news. The response can't be our silence. In fact, the opposite needs to be true. This is Hebrews 10.25. Because I think we get a sense in this room, and I actually gave this word to our young adults and our, and our students recently, our youth, after an encounter night, I held them back, and I was just, I had this word that God just dropped in my spirit about it feels kind of like the world is just getting darker, doesn't it? It's just, it feels like we're going down this spiral a little bit where, like, if you bring up Jesus, it instantly gets uncomfortable, but then we can talk about kids identifying as cats and dogs. You're like, <laughs> little Jimmy shows up to, to school, and he's like, I'm a dog now, and I can be nonverbal, and my teacher's got to be cool with it. That's insanity, all right, y'all? I don't know what we're doing. But then we, we, then we bring up Jesus. Here's the crazy thing, though. I love little Jimmy, too, right? I'm glad that he wants to be a dog. I probably wanted to be a dog at eight, too. But my parents were like, no, you're a boy, all right? <laughs> Come on. But we bring up Jesus, and all of a sudden it gets so uncomfortable, doesn't it? It feels like you can talk about just about anything else besides him. But a response can't be our silence. In fact, Hebrews 10, 25 says, as the day, capital D, approaches, it's talking about the coming back of the Lord. We just sang about it this morning. I see the king of glory coming on the clouds with fire. By the way, he doesn't make a grand entrance when he's born. He doesn't make a grand entrance when he comes to Jerusalem on the baby donkey. But he will make a grand entrance when he comes back and sets everything right. He parts the clouds. 
The trumpet blows like it's a grand entrance. And, he, and, and here's what the writer of Hebrews says. As you see that day approaching, don't forsake getting together like this and over at Boynton and at church at home and stirring one another up, encouraging one another as you see the day approaching. And the writer says, all the more as you see the day approaching. Church, our response cannot be our silence. And this was a gut check to me. That how many times have I walked by people how many times have I walked by them in the grocery store or out front of that coffee shop? Or I remember my last semester in, in college, I was walking down the halls. I, I did a two plus two program in a, a liberal arts college at first, and, and I just did not want to be there at all. I had the worst attitude about it. Like other people didn't want to be there too. It was like one of those places. It was just like, we're all just getting through. And I walked through the halls the last day and I feel like God opened my eyes and I saw people as souls, eternal souls. And I went into my car and wept. I was like, God, I had missed the opportunity to be a light in the darkness. Our response can't be our silence, church. In fact, all the more, we need to understand Proverbs 28.1. It says this, that the fool runs when no one pursues, but the righteous, the righteous, the righteous are as bold as a lion. The fool runs when no one pursues. They're like, ah, I shouldn't say anything about it at work. I shouldn't incorporate my faith in what I do. I shouldn't pray uh, for that like coworker. I shouldn't even bring up my faith. It's so faux pas. You know, we shouldn't do that nowadays. But can I ask you, church, what's the worst that could happen? You get fired from your job. Do you know that your boss isn't your provider, but Jesus is? Like, and I'm, I'm telling you, like, that's harder, right, to say. You're like, oh, my gosh, but I'm providing. People are counting on me. But I had to check myself, am, am I more worried about representing me or am I more worried about representing him? Am I more worried about what I look like in my image or am I more worried about what he looks like to the people around me? Because that's what he's called me to do. In fact, I love the disciples' response after being with Jesus. I love these guys because after Jesus has died and buried and risen, they get filled with the Holy Spirit and they are fired up for this, this message of the gospel. So much so that they find themselves in another very similar position. They're in a crowd. They've been healing people. They've been proclaiming the good news. And again, the local authorities are like, hey, you guys need to shut up and stop talking about that stuff. We're going to threaten to imprison you. We're going to threaten to silence you and beat you. You guys better watch it. We might even put you to death. And look at the response. This is Acts 4.20. You need to see this. Look at the boldness. We cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. They were so convinced. They just couldn't stop talking about it. They couldn't stop living it out because they were so convinced because they've seen and heard some things. And the greater question today, maybe for us in the room at Boynton or Church at Home Church, have you seen and heard some things? That was like equally as convicting to me. Have you personally seen and heard some things? And here's a, maybe to go a step further. This is why some of us may be quiet about our faith is because we have nothing to say. Our silence might be indicative that we actually have nothing to say. Maybe we're borrowing faith from a spouse. Well, this is kind of my wife's thing. This is why I'm here. Like, she loves this stuff, and I just kind of put up with it. There's like nervous wife laughter I just heard in the room. I was like, no, how do you know that? Like, what? He's just nudging them right now. Or no, this is just my husband's thing. I'm just kind of here to humor him. I don't really believe in all this. Or, 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 I'm kind of riding the coattails of my sweet granny's faith, man. She loved Jesus, and I, I, you know, I'm, I love her, and so, no, this is your relationship with him. Do you have something to say? Have you seen and heard some things? Are we so convinced that this is all true, that we live it, and it kind of spills out of us, and we talk about it, and we're vocal, so much so that we keep the rocks quiet? So much so that Jesus would walk with us in the crowd and he'd be like, guys, I'm sorry. They're a little rowdy. 
Because they, they can't stop talking about what they've seen and heard. I'm sorry. And if they were to keep silent, the rocks would just start crying out. Church, can we keep the rocks quiet? Can I get an amen? Are, are you feeling the, the tension in the room? Let me, let me maybe relieve it a little bit. Because you're like, Josh, I, I understand, like, I, I got to say something. But, but do you know those, like, those Christians who are super annoying, like, you know the guy, you know the guy on the news, like the guy on the news that they interview, it's got like a couple teeth and a foil hat on, and he's like, I'm a Christian out in, you know, somewhere in the south, I don't know where, they found this guy, and he's talking about aliens and the, and the second coming and all of it, and you're like, that guy is who they picked to represent us? Like, thanks, <laughs> whoever newscaster decided to... Hey, grab Bill. He looks like an educated fellow. He's going to talk about and represent the whole Christian faith right now on on public TV. I get it. And some of you are also like, dude, and I I know like some hyper-spiritual Henrys in my life that are like, dude, that guy, like he just is so annoying. He can't stop talking about it. And then he talks about his political view and he talks about, here's the third thing I, I picked up from the passage, okay? If we're going to be loud about Jesus, if we're going to live loud and speak loud and be vocal, we have to be loud about the right stuff. This is so key, church. This is so key. Look at the passage. The whole crowd began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. They say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. They're like, hey, we know where the glory is due. We know where the attention needs to be. You know what they weren't spouting? Their political view. They weren't there to push their own agenda. They weren't there to bash this group of people or that group of people. They weren't to be a keyboard warrior and just give everyone their peace of mind. And I want to challenge you further, church, over at Church Home in Boynton in the room. The world is so tired of that kind of Christian too. Because it's all truth with no grace. It's all opinion backed up with well, Jesus probably thought this, so like, ah, I'm going to give it to you. And I'm not saying that politics aren't important. I'm not saying those things. Like, I'll get emails, I'm sure, after this. It's all right. I'll take them. I love you. I'm not saying that's not important. But do you know that's not the main thing? I don't, I just, oh, I love you. I kind of care who gets elected, but my hope isn't there. I, I, I care about good policy and I care about those things. I, I'm telling you, I, I long for that for our country for sure. But ultimately, my hope and my peace is not in a man, government, or system. It's in Jesus. And I hope your hope is in the same place. It has to be. It has to be. It's actually one of my favorite things about Journey, and and it drives some people crazy, and I'm sorry if it does, but we don't get caught up in the fray and in the politics and in the sidebar conversations because we got to keep the main thing the main thing. Jesus said, if you lift me up, I'll draw all men to myself. If you just keep lifting me up. we got to be loud about the right stuff, church. we got to be loud about the right stuff. Your testimony, look at this if you're taking notes, your testimony is meant to testify about him, not you. And in an age of self-promotion, oh church, we're gonna have to continually fight the urge to promote us. You are told to build your brand and to build your voice and to build your platform and it's all about you and now everyone's got a platform and we gave everyone social media and everyone's got a voice now. And so few people care. I just got to let you know that. Like, and you get canceled in a second. Isn't that wild? Please, church, let's be on this Palm Sunday and moving forward. Let's be loud about the right stuff, about him and his kingdom and what he's done in your life. And it's the power of your testimony. But it begged that question, do you have something to say? Have you seen and heard some things? Because here's what I do believe in the room. 
and over at Boynton and Church at Home, all of us want great testimony. All of us want to overcome the enemy in this world and its schemes, right? Like we all want to live in that victory, right? We all want to live this victorious life where we do have signs and wonders and miracles in our lives. And we can point to like, man, God has showed up and showed off in my life. And man, I just know that I know that I know I'm a saved believer because I see him working. Because the Bible says in James that faith without works is dead. Isn't that interesting? Some of you are like, wait, are you questioning my salvation? That's between you and God. But if you were to examine your life and you're like, there's not a lot of like fruit and stuff. Like I, I, it's crazy that I feel like, man, I love coming to church and this feels good and I check my box. But if you don't do anything with it throughout the week and throughout the month and year, the Bible says that that's like a dead faith. It's not living and active. And I believe all of us want that. Do you want to be an overcomer church? Do you want to overcome the world and the enemy and not be bound down or weighed down by all the junk? Well, Jesus said there's kind of two ingredients that you need if you want to overcome. We know this through Revelation. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Hello. <laughs> and I'm going to lean into this a little bit here. Because I think... So many of us have felt beaten down by the enemy. And we don't know what to do with the world around us. We're like, man, it looks like it's you know, going to hell in a handbasket. I don't really know. And we're kind of on this white knuckle ride till eternity. And my Bible tells me the opposite. That we're actually supposed to be on mission, battering down the gates of hell. And the gates of hell won't prevail against the kingdom of God. Not the other way around. I used to read that so different as a kid. And I used to believe that in my church, that we were like the frozen chosen. And we're all behind the gates of, of the, you know, the kingdom. And we're all going to heaven, bless God. But then there's this evil world out there battering down the gates of the kingdom. That's not what my Bible says. The Bible says that the kingdom is forcefully advancing. My Bible says that the kingdom of God is actually battering at the gates of hell and we're taking back ground continually. And I want you to be part of that church. I want you to be part of overcoming. I want to be part of it. But in order to do that, we have these two ingredients that we see, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And I believe as I was even speaking, so many of you want that. So many of you want to live for God. You want to live boldly. You want to, you want to be loud about the right stuff. You understand that there's voices and forces trying to oppose you, but you want to be loud about the right thing. Can I encourage you this? You're going to overcome. You're going to live that way through the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. I want to unpack those two things for the last few minutes we have. Number one, the blood of the lamb. Do you know what the blood of Jesus has done for you? So, so many of us have lived under the tyranny of our shame and guilt, and we're in the room. And even as I was saying that, you're like, Josh, I could never be that person. I can't have that testimony. You have no idea what I've done. Those testimonies and stories are for like you pastor people and you religious people and those spiritual people, not for me. And that could not be further from the truth. That in fact, the blood of Jesus says so. And you're like, what are you, what are you talking about? What I love so much about the blood of Jesus, and again, I could go into this as a whole nother sermon for another day, but we needed his blood to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. This is a picture of the Old Testament when they would bring the, the sacrifice to the altar and it was shed blood for the remission of sin or for the forgiveness or the covering of sin. And Jesus said, I'm gonna come once and for all to do that for you, but my blood needs to be shed. But here's what's so beautiful about his blood. It has done some things for us. And I wanna just highlight them because I feel like so many of you, and maybe over at Boynton, you need to receive this or at church at home. Here's what his blood has done. And I want you to just listen in and receive this because you're like, no, I'm counting myself out. I couldn't be one of those people. And his blood, it says in, in Revelation that his blood, or in Hebrews, his blood speaks a better word. You said one thing or the enemy said one thing, his blood says another, let me show you. And these are all straight from scripture. The enemy says guilty. His blood says innocent. The enemy says dirty and unclean, used goods, and his blood says wash clean, new creation made perfect. The enemy says worthless, and his blood says worth it. The enemy says too far gone, and his blood says nothing's impossible. 
The enemy says illegitimate and his blood says adopted. The enemy says stained and his blood says spotless. There are so many of you in the room today and over at Boynton and Church at Home who need to receive that about yourself and walk in a true identity because some of you on the front half of those statements have lived in that for way too long. And on this Palm Sunday, would you wave your palm branches and say, Hosanna, Jesus, would you save me and make me new? Thank you for your blood that was shed and I receive what that's done. I don't care what the enemy has to say, your blood speaks a better word. And church, if we want to keep the rocks silent this Palm Sunday and beyond, we have to receive the second half of that statement. We actually need to start living by faith and building a testimony. We overcome. This is the writer of Revelation looking at the end of time. And he says, do you know how believers overcame the enemy? Through the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And not your wife's and not your sister's and not your granny's testimony. Your testimony. The Bible says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is your story. This is your faith. And you can begin to build it today by simply stepping out in faith and living out your faith in front of the world. And I don't want to overcomplicate this church. I don't want to overcomplicate what that looks like. Because some of you for too long, you've been like, man, I'm, I'm disqualified. <laughs> I can't do that. Yeah, you can with a little bit of courage and I want to show you. This is Acts 4.13. This is the disciples. I want you to look at something in this scripture. That crowd that was so amazed by what they said, look at what it says. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were, what's that word? Unschooled. What's the next word? Ordinary men. They were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Some of you are like, I can't do it. I don't, I'm pretty ordinary. Okay, you're qualified. Well, I'm unschooled. I don't know all the biblical terms and all the spiritual jargon. Perfect. You're qualified. You know what you need? It's just a little bit of courage. A little bit of courage and a lot of time of being with Jesus. And you can change the world. And that's not me. That's your Bible. That's the authoritative word of God. You can be ordinary, unschooled, not have all the answers with a little bit of courage and you can begin to change the world. What does that look like? It looks like at work, when that opportunity presents itself and you know the Holy Spirit's thumping on your heart and that person starts talking about faith or going through a hard time and you hear the Holy Spirit be like, pray for that person. But it might get weird in my office. Pray for that person. But, but what will it do to our friendship? Well, who are you representing? You or me? <laughs> or when on that team, student, God's calling you to be a spiritual leader on that team. And you're like, oh, I know what they do on the weekends, Pastor Josh, it's gonna be pretty hard. I get it. What are you gonna do though? Are you gonna be a light in darkness? As that darkness gets darker, are you gonna shine even brighter? That's the beauty of light and darkness. The darker it gets, the more noticeable that light is. How about this? <laughs> I'll end with this story. I want to give a shout out. Well, the story involves Jesus and, and co-ed softball, two of the most spiritual things I could think of, right? <laughs> I actually want to give a shout out to our Journey softball team, okay? I'm going to give a shout out to them real quick. Not only because they've won some championships, okay? Not, not to brag, but we're pretty good, all right? But I'm, I'm gonna, <laughs> that's so ridiculous that I'm bragging about co-ed softball. Forgive me, Lord. Here's why I'm actually bragging about them. They have lived and played and had fun and been vocal and bold so well on that field and on that team. There have been people they've invited into that team that are like, hey, you guys have something that I don't have. Can I have that? Just by playing softball. There have been people who have come to this church and been changed and experienced the presence of God because they played softball. <laughs> and you're like, is that, it? is that that easy? Yeah, kind of. Because just with a little bit of courage 
And no matter what life throws at me, I'm going to be the same person at the office and, and on, on Sunday at church and on my softball team or in school or in class or with my professor or with my friends. I'm the same person because the, the world is so tired of the church Christian who's like, on Sunday, I'm all good. And then you go and you don't tip your waitress well or you treat your, your waitress like crap. Or you go out into this traffic and you're cussing each other out. We see you, okay? My parking team is... My parking team has heard some colorful language, okay? Out of some of you sinners out there, all right? I get it. Church, I want to close. I want to I pray for us in just a moment. But could you be and could we be together? I'm going to lump me into this. A church that on this Palm Sunday and moving forward would just be loud about the right stuff, would be those people that are so bold with our faith, that live and love so boldly, because check this church, they'll know us, the word says, by the love that we have for one another. They'll know us by the grace we show to one another. And I heard a pastor recently say this, and it has just rung my bell, that grace, <laughs> excuse me, I'm gonna mess it up, but here, here it is. Truth without grace is just mean. But grace without truth is meaningless. And I feel like some of us are so hell bent on like, oh, I gotta give them the truth and I gotta win this argument and I gotta give them my opinion and I gotta tell them what. Be loud about the right stuff. Be loud about Jesus. And if you have nothing to say today, you can start. Maybe some of you need to give your life to Jesus for the first time. And our prayer teams are going to come down uh, this morning at the end of service. They would love to pray with you and lead you through what that means to have a real breathing relationship with Jesus. That you don't just punch a religious card week in and week out and nothing really happens. Because that, the Bible says, is a dead faith. If you want to have a real living, active, breathing relationship, you can come forward at the end of service. But church, can I just challenge us? <laughs> Let's keep the rocks quiet. Let, let's live and be such a light in darkness. So bold for Jesus that the world around us can't help but take notice of him. Let me pray for us. Would you bow your head, close your eyes all over this room over at Boynton Church at home. Father, we love you. Holy Spirit, I pray right now you come into the each room represented here. I love that we're one church in multiple locations. Would you just fall, Holy Spirit, and do what only you can do and convict hearts and change lives and change minds. God, maybe we've been today so bold just about the wrong stuff. Would you change our tune? Would you give us great testimony of who you are, your miraculous works, your provision in our life, your salvation, how you've changed and transformed us? The world around us can dismiss so much. They can try to dismiss the Bible. They can try to dismiss the historical account. They can try to dismiss all the stuff that we believe, but they can't dismiss us. A living, breathing epistle, as your word says, a living, breathing letter of salvation in front of them that says, no, 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 I have been changed by Jesus undeniably, and I am going to be loud about it in a loving and grace-filled way. I am going to live loud, and I don't care maybe what other people think. I care about what the King of Heaven thinks. And I want to live and love so boldly that people would look onto my life and say, man, that person has been with Jesus. Father, that is our prayer. We love you. Do what only you can do now. And we pray that in Jesus' name and all the Journey Church said, amen. Love you, church. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, church at home, I hope that you were just challenged by that message. I know that I was. And I want to ask you this question, just like Pastor Josh challenged, what does it look like to make the rocks quiet in your life this week? Maybe that sounds like a big task and it sounds a bit challenging. If it does, just this week, not, not all the time. What does it just look like this week and maybe even tomorrow? What does it look like to make the rocks quiet in your life? Maybe, maybe it's speaking to that coworker that you sit next to that you've been praying for, but you maybe feel led to not just pray in your own heart, in your own quiet, but to go up and speak to him. To ask him how he's doing. Maybe it looks like when you go out to lunch today, maybe you're about to go out to lunch right after watching this, or maybe you're sitting right now watching from a coffee shop. What does it look like for you to 
speak love to the people around you, to speak well to the barista or the waitress or whoever it is that's in front of you. How do you make the rocks quiet this week and even today, church? That's our challenge for you. As always, if you need prayer right now, we are a praying church. We believe that our God is living and active and we want to pray with you and on behalf of you you can scan the qr and also uh, go into the chat and we'll be praying for you we would love to just write in your prayer request into the chat we we want to pray with you we believe in the power of god to meet you where you're at and with that maybe keeping the rocks quiet this week looks like you actually inviting to easter so if you haven't maybe you can do do this if you're in person and you're in the local area we have invite cards and we would love to see you in person here for our services but if you're watching online it's super simple you can literally just share the link you can share an instagram post onto your story you could share the link that we'll be streaming at 9 a.m on easter sunday for our incredible easter services celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. So let's do that together. Let's be bold in our faith. And as we do that, we have amazing things coming beyond that. We have an encounter night, worship night, the week after Easter. And get this, church at home, for you right now, we actually have a pre-save for our new single for Journey Worship coming out that is going to be available on the screen. If you scan the little QR there, you can actually pre-save the new single coming out. It's coming out Friday after Easter. So lots of incredible things coming up. Easter week. We're celebrating all that Jesus has done, all that he's doing, and we're going to live out the Great Commission here today and make rocks quiet in our life. Amen? Amen. Well, know that you are loved. Know that you are loved, and let's go out and love this week. See you later, Church Dome.